This podcast details true crime cases. It contains adult themes and may contain descriptions of violence. It is not intended for children. Listener discretion is advised. Thank you for joining me for today's episode of Once Upon a Crime. This month, I'm sharing cases of people who, against all odds, survived some of the worst killers in modern history. In this week's story, a teenage girl is picked up by a seemingly ordinary couple and then spends two days trapped in a nightmare. She is the fifth victim of one of the rarest types of killers on record, a serial killer couple. But Kate Moyer would keep her wits about her, and even though she was only 17, she outsmarted the evil duo, ending their killing spree. This is the case of the Morehouse murder survivor, Kate Moyer. On the evening of November 9, 1986, 17-year-old Kate Moyer was hitchhiking along Stirling Highway, just outside of the port city of Fremantle in Western Australia. Kate had spent a night out with friends, and like many young people without a car at that time and place, decided to flag down a ride for the short drive home. Within a few minutes, a car pulled up, and a middle-aged woman stuck her head out and asked Kate if she knew the area. She said they were lost and asked for directions, giving Kate a street name. As Kate approached the car, she looked inside and saw a very thin man behind the wheel. Just as she got within a few feet of the vehicle, the woman jumped out and grabbed Kate. She saw the flash of a blade and noticed the woman was holding a very large knife. The man now rushed around the side of the car, and as Kate screamed and tried to pull away, the couple roughly pushed her into the back seat. The man got back behind the wheel and drove away quickly. The woman held the knife at Kate's neck and threatened her, telling her to shut up. It had all happened so fast. Kate was stunned, but immediately sensed she was in grave danger. Terrified, she asked, are you going to rape me or kill me? She saw the man and woman look at each other, grinning. The man answered, we'll only rape you, if you're good. Kate would later say that at that moment, she knew the worst was about to happen. Quote, you know you're going to die, she recalled but you don't acknowledge that to yourself. You just live it. They took Kate to a small unkempt house a short drive east of Fremantle. The house on 3 Morehouse Street in Willoughby was an eyesore in the mostly neat and tidy working class neighborhood. Weeds dotted the unwatered front yard and shrubs were untended and overgrown, blocking the front windows. Once inside, Kate was bound with ties around her wrists and ankles. The couple sat her down and grilled her about her name, age, and where she lived. They wanted to know if anyone would report her missing right away. Whom did she live with? Did she have parents, a boyfriend, or friends who would immediately start searching? Kate wasn't sure how to answer, trying to piece together how to respond correctly in order to stay alive. Once they were satisfied they had time, the couple, the skinny man with the sharp pointed nose, and the plain-faced woman with pinched lips and dark hair, seemed to relax. Now they appeared to enjoy watching Kate's terror and laughed at her promises not to report them if they would just release her and let her go home. Grabbing her roughly, lifting her to her feet and pushing her towards the bathroom, the man forced her to shower. Shivering with fear, even under the hot water, Kate did as she was told. When she was done, they brought her into the living room where they smoked weed. They forced Kate to smoke with them. They put a movie in the VCR and made her watch it with them. After a while, the couple grew bored with this and turned on music. They now instructed Kate to dance for them. The man made crude comments about her body while she danced and sobbed, feeling violated and humiliated. Suddenly, he grabbed her and roughly pushed her into a bedroom. She saw chains wrapped around the headboard and began screaming and fighting, but she was no match for the two of them as they forced her onto her back on the bed and placed chains around her wrists. They put a gag around her mouth to muffle her screams, while at the same time threatening her with a knife if she didn't keep quiet and comply with their demands. The man raped Kate twice while the woman sat watching, but Kate thought watching wasn't the right word. 
the woman was studying Kate being raped. Bizarrely, she saw that the woman had a notebook and a pen and appeared to be taking notes as she watched the assault. When he was done, she was taken to the front room. Would they kill her now? Kate was convinced they wouldn't let her go. She'd seen their faces and knew where their house was located. Why would they let her live? But on the off chance she somehow escaped, Kate took note of everything she could inside of the house to describe later. Maybe she thought they'd let her go, knowing it was her word against theirs and the police might not believe her. She was a teen who'd been hitchhiking at night and they were an older married couple. The woman described the man as my husband, quote, do what my husband says and you won't get hurt, she'd said. So Kate committed to memory things like the titles of the movies next to the VCR and the furniture layout. Kate realized her nightmare was far from being over when they brought her the telephone and with a knife to her throat, made her call her parents. The woman stayed beside Kate with the weapon while her husband got on the other phone extension to listen in. It was late when the phone rang at Kate's house. Half asleep, her mother answered the phone. Kate told her she'd been out with friends and had, quote, drank too much, so she was going to sleep over at her friend's house. She hoped this would offer a clue to them that something wasn't right. Kate wasn't a drinker. She prayed they would call her friends to check out the story, but still not fully awake. Her mother just said okay before falling back asleep. Kate was raped again, and then once again forced to shower. Then the woman gave her a pen and paper to write letters to her loved ones, saying she'd run away. Kate cried as she scribbled out letters to her parents and boyfriend. In the letter to her boyfriend, she added a secret code she hoped he would decipher, so maybe these people, who she was now sure would kill her, might be caught. She mentioned three trees, three ferns, three pine trees, and seven houses in her letter. These numbers were the beginning of the phone number of the house she was being held captive in. She'd committed them to memory after seeing the phone number printed on the phone. For you youngins, old landline rotary phones typically had the number labeled on the phone itself. Kate was left chained to the bed, but could hear the couple talking in the other room. They laughed about what they'd done, and she also heard them mention other girls. Kate understood now that they'd had other victims. By the snippets of conversation she overheard, a horrifying reality came into focus. These girls had been killed, and so far, this evil couple had gotten away with it. But instead of giving up hope, the reality of her dire situation caused Kate to focus and strategize about her best chance for survival. She stopped pleading with them and instead became cooperative. She thought if she could win the woman over to her side, perhaps she'd show her some compassion or at least let her guard down enough so Kate could escape. Kate asked if she could please be untied to use the bathroom, and the woman agreed. Kate asked for small favors, for a glass of water or to stretch her legs. It had been several hours since she'd been abducted, and she could tell the woman was getting tired of watching her. The man had gone to sleep in the other bedroom, but left his wife awake, guarding their captive. Kate took the few seconds of freedom she had to leave clues around the house, stuffing a small slip of paper with her name on it in a couch cushion and dropping her lipstick behind a chair. Finally, the woman took her to the smaller bedroom and tied her up again. She handed Kate sleeping pills and insisted she swallow them. Kate pretended to, but once the woman had gone locking her in the room, she spit them out and put them under the mattress. Kate thought if she fell asleep, she'd never wake up. Kate stayed awake until she saw the sunlight beginning to peek through the covered windows in the room on Morehouse Street, where she was being held prisoner. She heard the couple talking in another part of the house, and then there was silence. Moments later, the woman entered the room. She said her husband had gone to work. Kate would later say, I changed my odds of survival to 50-50 because I was alone with just the woman now. She allowed Kate to come into the kitchen and eat. While she did so, the woman read the morning paper. She heard her chuckle and Kate asked, what's so funny? The woman showed her a picture printed in the newspaper. It was a photo of a woman named Denise Brown. The 21-year-old had been in the news for almost a week, having gone missing after leaving a local pub to catch a bus home. The woman laughed and said, you'd think a big girl like that could look after herself. It was impossible to tell from the girl's photo what size she was, as it just showed her face. 
Kate said she instantly knew that this woman and her husband had taken and probably killed Denise Brown. Kate knew her best shot now was to try and win this woman's trust. She thought that if her captor let her guard down enough, she might just have a chance to escape. I was very compliant. I was very nice, Kate later told detectives. She listened to a Dire Straits CD with the woman, a band she seemed to love since she'd played it over and over the night before. They also watched the movie Rambo together. She even allowed Kate to accompany her outside for a few minutes. By this time, she'd untied her and let Kate walk around the house freely, as long as she was within eyesight. Earlier, Kate had heard the woman on the phone talking to someone. The conversation led her to believe she was ordering drugs to be delivered to the house. Kate was in the front door sitting with the woman and watching a movie when there was a knock at the door. The woman jumped up and pushed Kate away from the door and into the bedroom. She told her to keep quiet and not make a sound or she'd kill her. Locking the door behind her, the woman went to answer the door. In her haste to get Kate away from the door, she hadn't had time to chain her up. Now Kate knew that this was her only chance for survival. Quickly, she moved to the window, terrified that the sound of turning the lock and sliding it open would cause the woman to run back into the room. Her heart pounding, Kate opened the window as fast as she could and jumped out. She was out, but not yet convinced that she was home free. She ran down the road as fast as her legs would carry her. She was barefoot, wearing just underwear and a tank top. When she was out of sight of the house, she began banging at doors and crying out for someone to help her. But it was a Monday afternoon, and this was a working class neighborhood. No one was home. Kate continued to run, and turning the corner, she saw a row of shops. She ran to one and saw a man in a suit standing out front. Help me, I've been raped, she cried. Please take me inside and call the police. Kate Moyer was taken to the Palmyra police station, where she told her story of being abducted and raped. Wanting them to take her seriously, Kate kept her emotions in check and gave as much detail as possible. But ironically, her calmness had the opposite effect on the officers. They thought that she was making something out of nothing and perhaps had just spent the night out without permission from her parents and was trying to find a way to get out of trouble. The result was that they showed no sense of urgency in investigating her story. Instead, she was passed on to a junior officer, 22-year-old Laura Hancock. Hancock was so new to the force that Kate's was the first witness statement she'd ever taken down. She read Kate's demeanor differently than the other officers had. To her, it was evident that Kate was coming out of some sort of horrendous ordeal. It became apparent fairly quickly that Kate was in some form of shock, Hancock later stated. Kate provided one detail that would make the previously skeptical cops sit up and take notice. While inside the bathroom at the house on Morehouse Street, she'd observed a medication bottle. On the label was typed the name David Burney. David Burney had been on investigators' radar because he had a long rap sheet for breaking and entering, burglary, and theft. But his name had also come up after several women had gone missing from the local area. Burney was a local ne'er-do-well known as a sexual deviant with a history of sexual offenses. Kate Moyer was asked if she thought she could lead them to the house where she'd been held. Although terrified at the thought of being asked to return to the House of Horrors on Morehouse Street, Kate agreed to point it out from the safety of the police car. Would you like to receive texts from Once Upon a Crime? You can opt in by texting OUAC to 408-676-1770. That's the letters OUAC to 408-676-1770. You'll receive texts alerting you to new episodes, special giveaways, true crime trivia, and more. The information is in the show notes as well as on our website, truecrimepodcast.com. Text messaging is provided by TextSanity.com. Text message rates may apply. David John Burney was born to John and Margaret Burney on February 16, 1951. He was the oldest of five children, raised in a semi-rural neighborhood in eastern Perth. David's mother was a chronic alcoholic. As a result, the Burney home was unkempt and the children often were dirty and unfed. 
David's father was often unwell and was away from his family for long hours at work when he wasn't laid up ill. Whether this was his best attempt to provide for his large family or a way to escape the chaos and unhappiness of his home life is debatable. Neighbors of the Bernies recall the family as, quote, particularly dysfunctional. The children were often left to fend for themselves when their mother was out drinking. It was reported by more than one person that Margaret Bernie would leave the children alone while she went drinking, and when she had no money for taxi fare, would bring cab drivers home with her, trading sex for payment. Perhaps this is why sexual acting out began early by the children in the Bernie household. It was long rumored that incestuous relationships sprang up between the siblings, mainly with the older children forcing the younger ones to perform sexual favors. Later, some of David's siblings would confirm that sexual abuse occurred in the home, with David, the oldest, being the main perpetrator. In this Lord of the Flies environment, the Bernie children grew up learning to lie, cheat, and steal to survive. They were in and out of state care when authorities would step in due to neglect and remove them from their parents' custody. David, although bright, dropped out of school at the age of 15. He was small and skinny and was picked on as a child. Unable to make friends due to his poor social skills, he overcompensated by acting arrogant and aloof. David Burney would always be a loner who drove people away by his awkwardness and his tendency to turn any conversation or attempt at connection into something sexual. His small stature made him an ideal candidate to become an apprentice horse jockey. He was allowed to apprentice under jockey Eric Parnham at the Ascot Racecourse, giving him a chance for a career and a future. But Bernie was soon asked to leave his position. It was discovered that he was treating the horses cruelly and exposing himself to strangers. But the final straw was when he entered the bedroom of his boarding house landlady and attempted to rape the woman. He'd entered her bedroom naked with a stocking over his head, but was scared off by her screams. He was soon identified and given his walking papers. He returned to Perth and bounced around, living hand to mouth. He began breaking and entering buildings to steal whatever he could get his hands on to trade or to sell. He was caught and arrested for several misdemeanors by the time he was 18. Around this time, David Burney reconnected with a childhood friend named Catherine Harrison. He and Catherine, or Kathy, had been separated for several years after getting into trouble together in their pre-teen years. David and Kathy lost contact after he was sent to yet another foster home. Catherine Harrison was born on May 23, 1951, just a few months after David Burney. Kathy also had an unstable childhood. Tragically, she'd lost her mother when she was just two years old. Doreen Harrison had died giving birth to Kathy's baby brother, who also died. Her father, Harold, was distraught over his wife's death and overwhelmed trying to raise his motherless child, so she was sent to live with her maternal grandparents. Kathy was a sad child who often seemed lost and lonely. Like David, she had no friends and was a loner for a different reason. She didn't seem to bond with her elderly grandparents or anyone, but still seemed starved for attention and affection. Perhaps like David, the loss of her mother stunted her ability to bond with others. For David, it was neglect. For Kathy, loss. Kathy did have a stable home for the first 10 years of her life, living with her grandparents. But when she was 10, her father decided he wanted his daughter back, and a custody battle ensued. Kathy eventually returned to her father, losing the only home she'd known since the age of two. Her father now lived in the suburb of Perth in Western Australia and was neighbors with the Burnies. David and Kathy became acquainted while still in grade school. There was something about the skinny boy that she was instantly attracted to. Maybe they formed a mutual trauma bond, or perhaps she sensed that he was as lonely as she was. Kathy thought the sun rose and set on David Burney and became dependent on his attention and approval. For the first time, this gave David a sense of power and control. From his earliest days, his life had been chaotic and unstable, and Kathy became his anchor and biggest fan. He was as dependent on her attention and affection as she was on his. Desperate for David's approval, Kathy was happy to follow whatever he suggested. She joined in when he began breaking into homes and shops and stealing. Together, they committed a series of petty crimes. Kathy would often be returned home to her father after a talking to by the authorities. 
Her father punished her and forbade her from seeing David Burney, but Kathy would not be swayed. Kathy and David began a sexual relationship before they were 14. They were utterly infatuated with each other, but David was sent away after being removed from his parents' care once more. Kathy was crushed. After David lost his apprenticeship at the racetrack and returned to Perth, she was thrilled. They reconnected quickly, and together they began committing another series of breaking and entering crimes. By this time, David Burney had a severe sex addiction. Even though he was having sex with Kathy, it was never enough for him. His younger brother said that David would become angry and violent if he didn't have sex every day or even several times per day. He was also addicted to pornography. When his younger brother James was just a teenager, David told him he hadn't had sex in a few days. He told his brother he wanted to have sex with him, but James refused. In the middle of the night, James woke up to find David on top of him. David and Kathy began their life of crime together as thieves. They continued breaking into local businesses and finally faced serious charges when they were caught after stealing a safe from a drive-in theater. Both 18, they were charged with breaking and entering and theft of goods totaling over $3,000. David was sentenced to nine months in prison. Kathy was given probation. However, later that year, they came before a judge once more to answer to charges from a previous theft. David had three years added to his sentence, and Kathy had another four years added to her probation. The pair were now separated for an extended period for the first time. Both were desperate to be together again. David broke out of prison a year into his sentence, and the duo reunited. It wasn't long before they continued their criminal ways. In July of 1970, they were arrested once again for theft, receiving stolen property, and breaking and entering. In their possession, police found 106 of gelinite and explosive, 120 detonators, and three fuses. They both pled guilty, and David had three more years tacked onto his sentence. Kathy was incarcerated as well. She was sentenced to serve six months in a detention center. When David Burney broke out of prison to be with Kathy, she was pregnant with another man's child. At age 19, Kathy gave birth to the baby while in detention. The child was removed from her custody at birth. Away from David Burney, Kathy thrived. During her incarceration, she was well-behaved and even earned an early release. She was recommended for a job as a live-in housekeeper for the McLaughlin family in Fremantle. One of her employer's sons, Donald McLaughlin, found Kathy sweet and shy. Donald, 10 years Kathy Sr., fell in love and asked her to marry him. She accepted, and the two were wed in May of 1972, on Kathy's 21st birthday. Kathy and Donald would have several children, seven in all. But in 1972, their first child, Donald Jr., was tragically killed when he was backed over by a car in the family driveway. Kathy witnessed the toddler's death, and it scarred her forever. Donald provided for the family with a good salary as a council employee, but their financial situation took a nosedive when he suffered a back injury, rendering him unable to work. The family was finally forced into government housing, and Kathy's depression worsened. She was responsible for six children and her disabled husband, and had to work outside of the home to help support the family. She began thinking back to her time with David Burney. She still considered Burney her true love and pined for her old flame. She gave up trying to keep the house clean or parent her children, who began to run wild. Meanwhile, David Burney was released from prison and began another relationship. He married at the age of 21. He and his wife Carrie had a daughter they named Tanya. Carrie Burney would later say that David was a good husband and father at the beginning of their marriage. However, while working on a barge, he sustained a head injury and was never the same afterward. He began having angry outbursts over minor issues and started a series of affairs. Carrie wasn't aware of these extramarital relationships and was trying to be patient with her husband's change in behavior since his accident. But when she found out he was having sex with a 16-year-old girl, she kicked him out. Their marriage ended after 10 years. While Kathy was pining for her lost love, David Burney, David had never forgotten her either. Now he went looking for her. In 1982, she and David reunited. They would embark on a killing spree together within a few short years.
Catherine was married for 10 years and had seven children when David Burney returned to her life. They began a secret affair while Kathy figured out how to leave her husband to be with David. One day in 1985, Kathy vanished after she was dropped off at work by her husband. Donald looked for her and finally found her living with David Burney. She refused to come home, abandoning her marriage and six children. Her youngest child, Peter, was only six when he was left motherless. Catherine began referring to David as her husband while still legally married to Donald. She changed her last name to Bernie by deed poll, but the couple was never legally married. She and David moved into a small home in a quiet neighborhood of Willoughby. They began their life together at 3 Morehouse Street. It was an address that would become infamous in Australia for the horrors that would occur there. David and Catherine Burney spent their time having sex, smoking marijuana, and getting high on heroin and prescription drugs. Catherine was always a willing partner in whatever David wanted, and she tried to keep up with his seemingly insatiable sexual appetite, even as it became more violent and degrading. He even asked Kathy to have sex with other men so he could watch, including one of his brothers. David soon became bored, no matter what new fetish or craving Catherine complied with. She began to worry that he would grow bored of her and she'd lose him. She encouraged him to share all of his hidden fantasies with her. David told her about a long-held fantasy of kidnapping a woman, imprisoning her, and turning her into his sex slave. He described scenarios around these dark imaginings, and to his surprise and delight, Kathy joined in, urging him on. Having openly admitted these violent fantasies to his partner, David now took it a step further and asked Kathy if she'd help him satisfy these disturbing needs. She agreed. In her mind, as long as she was part of them, she could help keep David tied to her. Just like when they committed burglary together, taking the risk made their union more exciting. Sharing these secrets also created a stronger bond between them. In 1985, David was hired at a car wrecking company. Around the same time, he began stalking women around town. He attempted to start conversations with these women to gauge if they would be good candidates for his sick fantasy. He tried different ploys to persuade them to get in his car, but was unsuccessful. Most of the women he approached thought he came off as a creep and told him to take a hike. He wasn't confident in physically subduing a woman and taking her by force. If you'll recall, he was small and very thin, almost scrawny. Then he hit on an idea of how Catherine could help him. It was common for young girls and women to accept rides from strangers then. The area around Perth in the mid-1980s had a very low crime rate, and people were more trusting of strangers. They could take advantage of this, Bernie thought, especially if they worked together as a team. A girl might reject a ride from a man alone, but if a couple approached them with the offer, they would likely accept. David and Kathy began cruising the streets at night, looking for women who were alone. The plan was that if they spotted a girl they liked, they'd pull over. Once she accepted the ride and got into the car, Kathy would decide if she was suitable. To signal to David that she approved, she would say, I have the munchies. With that code phrase, their victim's fate would be sealed. The first woman to fall victim was 22-year-old Mary Frances Nielsen. In October 1986, David was working at the auto wrecking yard when Mary inquired about purchasing used tires. He told her he could give her a cut-rate deal on some tires he had stored in his garage. She should come by his house, and his wife could show them to her, he said. Mary agreed, and on the evening of October 6, she knocked on the door of 3 Morehouse Street. She was attacked as soon as she entered the house, bound and gagged, and chained to the bed in the spare bedroom. David raped her while Kathy watched. Kathy observed closely to see what, quote, turned on David the most so that she could recreate this for him later. These were the notes Kate Moyer would later observe her writing down. Very twisted. Afterward, when he was done with his victim, Mary was wrapped in a blanket to be transported to their car. They drove her to the Glen Eagle State Forest, about 30 miles southwest of Willoughby. Once there, David raped her again. Afterward, he removed a nylon cord from the car trunk and strangled her until she ceased breathing. She was stabbed before being buried in a shallow grave to ensure that she was dead. 
Bernie drove the young woman's car and abandoned it in the parking lot of the Perth police headquarters. He thought that this was the last place the police would look for it. Less than two weeks later, David and Kathy cruised along the Sterling Highway looking for their next victim. 15-year-old Susanna Candy was a straight-A student at Hollywood High School. On October 20th, she was walking alone after finishing her shift at her part-time restaurant job when the Bernies pulled over and offered her a lift. Threatening the teen with a knife, they drove her to Morehouse Street, where she was chained to the bed and raped. Susanna would be kept alive for several days, repeatedly raped, and forced to write letters to her parents, saying she was okay but had, quote, left to sort out some problems, end quote. Growing tired of keeping her, David Bernie tried to strangle her with a nylon cord, but she became hysterical and fought him off. The couple then forced sleeping pills down her throat until she passed out. David then held the rope out to Kathy and said, prove you love me. Catherine strangled Susanna Candy to death. They returned to the Glen Eagle Forest and buried Susanna's body next to Mary Nielsen's. 31-year-old Nolene Patterson was driving home from work on November 1st when her car ran out of gas. Nolene was a former flight attendant, now employed as a bar and restaurant manager at the Nedlands Golf Club in Perth. Nolene was beautiful, accomplished, and elegant, and David Burney instantly knew he wanted her when he saw her standing next to her car on the Canning Highway. Nolene was relieved as she recognized the Burneys. They lived in the same neighborhood. But she was shocked when Catherine brought out a large knife and threatened her. The pattern was repeated once more, with Nolene held captive in the Bernie's home and raped. But something was different this time. David Bernie liked Nolene and kept her alive for several days. Kathy became increasingly jealous, especially when David kept putting off killing her. Nolene saw an opportunity to try and ingratiate herself with David Bernie, hoping it might save her life. But while he seemed reluctant to harm her, Kathy became enraged. She finally snapped, sobbing hysterically and holding a knife to her own throat. She gave David an ultimatum. Either he killed Nolene, or she would kill herself in front of him. David, alarmed, relented. They forced Nolene to take sleeping pills, and then he strangled her as Kathy watched. Nolene's body was taken to their dumping ground in the state forest, but David wouldn't bury her with the other women. He considered her special and wanted her body buried separately. This only served to anger Kathy further. Calling the dead woman vile names, Kathy took pleasure in throwing dirt on her face before she was buried. The last woman killed was picked up with almost no time passing between victims. Denise Brown was waiting at a bus stop on November 4th after leaving a pub. The 21-year-old accepted a ride from the couple and soon found herself held captive on Morehouse Street. She was kept alive for two days, during which time she was forced to phone her parents and say she was okay and would be home soon. Soon afterward, Denise was driven to a pine forest north of Perth. David increased the violence he subjected his victim to, raping her multiple times in the forest. During the last rape, he cut the young woman's throat. Incapacitated but not yet dead, Kathy brought him the large knife, and he plunged it into Denise's chest. They dug a shallow grave and placed her body into it, but the woman sat up and gasped as they began to bury her. Shocked and panicked, David grabbed an axe from the car and hit the woman twice, splitting her skull and killing her instantly. This final act was almost too much for Kathy to take. They had been abducting, raping, and killing women for nearly a month, but this gruesome murder had finally shaken her. She later told investigators that this may have been why she'd been so careless with their final victim, survivor Kate Moyer. She didn't know if she had it in her to take part in another murder, Kathy claimed. After her escape, Kate Moyer was driven to Morehouse Street to point out the house where her abductors had taken her. As they drove up and she saw the house, the composed young woman began to sob and curled up into a fetal position in the back of the police car. All she could do was point to the house. Reliving her horror at the sight of 3 Morehouse Street, she could not utter any words. 
She was then taken to the hospital to be examined. An officer was stationed outside her room to assure the terrified teen that she was safe. No one was home when police knocked on the door of the Bernie's house. After Kate escaped, Kathy had called David in a panic. He'd left work and returned home. The couple quickly went through the house to scrub it of any evidence. They got rid of the chains in the bedrooms, the clothing Kate had been forced to leave behind, and anything else they could think of. They both then left the house and David returned to work. Police staked out the home until Catherine returned. They waited for her to enter the house and then knocked on the door. According to one detective, she answered and didn't appear surprised to see officers at her door. Quote, she was quite aggressive. We told her we were inquiring about a young lady who had reported being abducted, held captive, and raped in this house. End quote. Catherine Bernie refused to speak to the officers without her husband. She denied knowing anything about it. The officers had a warrant to search the house and found things as Kate had described. They also found the clues she'd told them she'd left behind as proof of her story. They arrested Catherine. Investigators arrived at David Burney's place of employment and questioned him about Kate Moyer's claims. He said he knew Kate and admitted that they'd had sex, but said it was consensual. He was also arrested and taken to police headquarters to be questioned further. Bernie was interrogated for several hours as investigators saw parallels between Kate Moyer's story and details of several other missing girls and women's cases in the past few weeks. Most were last known to be hitchhiking, walking, or catching a bus alone. Most chillingly, each missing woman contacted a family member to assure them that they were okay before completely disappearing. Kate Moyer told police that she'd also been forced to place such a call. Day turned into night, and David Burney was still being questioned. Just before night fell, Detective Sergeant Paul Ferguson thought the suspect was on the edge of confessing. Burney asked to speak to his wife, Kathy, almost as if he wanted her permission to say more. Unable to permit this request, the detective sighed, looked out of the window at the sun setting, and sarcastically said, It's getting dark, David. Best we take a shovel and dig them up. To his surprise, David answered, Okay, there are four of them. He then confessed to the murders of Mary Nielsen, Susanna Candy, Nolene Patterson, and Denise Brown. Detectives entered another room where Catherine was waiting and informed her that David had confessed. Upon hearing that he'd given them up, Kathy also confessed. It was still dark, but before their suspects could change their minds, detectives drove them to the locations where they said they'd buried the bodies. David Burney seemed relieved to admit to what he'd done. Catherine appeared almost proud of it. The couple led them to a forest off the highway and about 400 yards off the main road. David Burney pointed to a mound of sand and told them to dig. There they found the body of Denise Brown, who'd been reported missing just five days earlier. They next directed them to the Glen Eagle picnic area near Armandale. Up an incline about 40 yards off a trail, the body of Mary Nielsen, missing since October 6th, was found. They next pointed out the area where Susanna Candy had been buried, just a kilometer further up. Kathy insisted she would lead them to the body of Nolene Patterson. On the way, she told detectives that she hated Nolene and was glad that she was dead. After pointing out where the woman was buried, Kathy spat on the grave, still jealous of her rival. Catherine showed no remorse for her part in the murders. David Burney did express some regret for what he'd done. What a pointless loss of young life, he remarked as he was driven back to police headquarters to be booked. Catherine and David Burney were charged with four counts of murder, two counts of aggravated sexual assault, and one count of deprivation of liberty for holding Kate Moyer captive. Three months later, David Burney pleaded guilty to four counts of murder and one count of abduction and rape. When asked why he pled guilty, David answered, for the families of the victims, that was the least I could do. Catherine Burney was ordered to undergo a psychological evaluation, and once she was deemed legally sane, she also pled guilty and admitted to her part in the murders. The two murderers mouthed, I love you, to each other in court, and whenever she was close enough to him, Kathy would touch David's hand, stroking it with one finger. David rarely spoke and appeared subdued, but Catherine was defiant, 
kicking and screaming at court officers if they placed hands on her to take her in or out of the courtroom. It was as if she couldn't stand any other man besides David touching her. Both received the maximum sentence allowed, life in prison. David Burney was to be housed in a maximum security facility. The judge stated, quote, The law is not strong enough to express the community's horror at this sadistic killer who tortured, raped, and murdered four women. In my opinion, David John Burney is such a danger to society that he should never be released from prison, end quote. Upon handing down Catherine Burney's sentence, the judge addressed her, saying, quote, In my opinion, you should never be released to be with David Burney. You should never be allowed to see him again, end quote. Reporters posed the question, who was the most responsible for the murders, David or Catherine Burney? There were conflicting views about this. Detective Sergeant Paul Ferguson said, quote, Kathy, I would say, was the principal organizer of this whole thing. She believed that women were put on this earth to do what men wanted, and she believed that David had been hurt by women, so therefore women should pay. She had absolutely no qualms about killing women, end quote. Sergeant Chris Cassidy said, I think they are equally as culpable and equally as evil. But psychologists who studied the Bernies believed that Catherine would never have killed if not for David. They stated that Catherine was obsessed with David, utterly dependent on his love and approval, and would do anything for him, including murder. It's the worst case of personality dependence I've seen in my career, one psychologist noted. Both David and Catherine Burney postured for the cameras after receiving their sentences. A crowd had gathered outside the courtroom, hurling insults at them and calling them monsters. Catherine smirked while David blew them a kiss before being shuttled off to prison. David Burney was sent to Fremantle Prison, but was soon moved to solitary confinement for his safety. He was repeatedly beaten by other prisoners while housed in the general population. He attempted suicide during the first year of his sentence. Three of the original death row cells were converted to provide him with his own cell. He remained there until the prison closed in 1991. The cell he occupied can occasionally be viewed on a true crime tour held daily at Fremantle Prison. Within the first few years of their incarceration, David and Catherine Burney exchanged letters, over 2,600 in all. David was said to be deeply depressed once he and Catherine were separated. They were not allowed visits or phone calls. Their request to be legally married was also denied. In 1990, David Burney attempted to file a lawsuit for being denied access to Kathy. He claimed he was, quote, suffering physical and mental breakdown and was suicidal due to the separation. The court rejected his suit. In 1993, his personal computer was removed from his cell after it was found to contain pornographic software. Catherine Burney suddenly stopped corresponding with David in 1997. She had decided to try to appeal to the parole board for eventual release, and she knew she didn't have a chance if she was still in contact with her accomplice. She claimed that being apart from David Burney helped her, quote, clear the madness that resulted in her crimes. She was first eligible to apply for parole in 2007. She has applied as allowed by law every three years since 2007 and has been denied each time. Now in her 70s, she is the longest serving prisoner at Bandiup Women's Prison, having served 34 years. Kate Moyer began a campaign to end the Western Australian law that automatically makes prisoners eligible for parole every three years after they've served 20 years. She started a Change.org petition to lobby to reduce the frequency of reviews allowed for prisoners serving life sentences. I want to see no parole for willful murder, no parole for sex offenders, Kate stated in her petition. David Burney never applied for parole, having taken his own life before he became eligible. In 2004, a former prisoner incarcerated at Fremantle Prison claimed he had been raped by Burney and convicted pedophile Adrian Barrett in 1999. After an investigation, the former inmate, only identified as Peter, was compensated more than $70,000 by the government. However, the funds have been withheld pending an appeal. The following year, in 2005, David Burney was found dead in his cell. He had hanged himself using a cord attached to an air vent. He was 54 years old. He would have become eligible to apply for parole one year later. 
Catherine was not allowed to attend his funeral, and his body remained unclaimed for several weeks. He was finally given a state burial. The house at Three Morehouse Street still stands, and over the years has occasionally been used as a rental property. In the past, new tenants were not informed of its dark history. Once this was discovered, there was a public outcry. Now real estate companies are legally required to share this type of information with potential owners or renters in Western Australia. In 2021, a young couple purchased the house. They said they knew its history, which didn't affect their decision to buy the property. They report no supernatural events occurring while they've occupied the home. Investigators credit Kate Moyer for ending the Bernie's killing spree. If it weren't for her bravery, quick thinking, and action, they have no doubt the killings would have continued. Kate Moyer may have saved countless other young women's lives, they've said, and consider her a hero. Kate is now married and has three children. She has become a successful business owner. She has also written a book about her ordeal and has been interviewed for several true crime shows and documentaries over the years. That will do it for this episode of Once Upon a Crime. I'll be sharing a few more details that didn't make it into this episode on a bonus episode. I'll tell you what became of David Bernie's daughter and Catherine's children and what they've said about their parents being multiple murderers. I'll also give updates on their former spouses and the crimes committed by David Bernie's siblings. In addition, I'll share a little more about Catherine Bernie's time behind bars, and we'll discuss whether the Bernies may have had additional victims yet unnamed. All that and more will be revealed on a Patreon bonus episode. You can listen to this episode and more bonus episodes by becoming a Patreon member. To find out more and join, go to patreon.com slash onceuponacrime. There's a link in the show notes. Once Upon a Crime is written and produced by me, Esther Sanchez Ludlow. My co-producer is Lorena Garcia. Research was provided for this episode by Emma Battaglia. Until next time, be good to one another.